Our last speaker will be Michael Albert, the editor of Z Magazine, and then we'll have a discussion forum afterwards. Uh, I'm just curious, is there anybody here who is um, feeling a little twinge that they're not at home watching the 200 meter race? Raise your hand. I see no hands, one hand. Well, actually, I think that's a serious problem. Um, so maybe at the end or in the question and answer period, we can address why or maybe I can get to it in the talk. My, my topic was uh, why dissent um, and with what logic? Uh, why protest, why demonstrate, and with what logic? Well, the reason we dissent is obviously in considerable part because there are things that we don't like that are going on. Uh, let me just enumerate a few of those, um, hopefully not being redundant. When Arthur started, he said that uh, globalization was in some conceptual sense uh, rearranging, not, not increasing interactivity or interconnectivity, but rearranging the relationships uh, that exist globally to affect power relations. Well, in, um, in uh, 1980, uh, CEOs in the United States earned what 42 factory workers earned. In, uh, by 1989, CEOs earned what 122 factory workers earned. And as of 1996, they earned what 209 factory workers earned. That is to say, one CEO earned what 209 factory workers earned. That's a trajectory of change which um, isn't only affected by, but is, is a manifestation of the kinds of power differentials and changes that Arthur was talking about. In 1987, which is the most recent year I have uh, some data for, there were 32.5 million people in the United States who lived below the poverty level. One out of every ten white people, one out of every three blacks, and comparable for Latinos and Native Americans. At the other end of the spectrum, if uh, you were to earn $200,000 a day, five days a week, that's a million dollars a week, it would take you 2,000 years to earn as much as Bill Gates now has in his wealth. The only problem is you wouldn't catch up, because Bill Gates would have been earning 200 times as much each week in interest. In the Upper East Side of New York, uh, there are households, we now go down from capitalists to uh, lawyers, doctors, engineers, high-level professionals. Uh, the average household income in the Upper East Side of New York is $300,000. If you go one mile north into East Harlem, the average family income is $6,000, one fiftieth. In the United States, there is one uh, successful suicide every 20 minutes, and at the same 20 minutes, there are nine unsuccessful attempts. There are about 3 million homeless people in the United States. There are also 49,000 hotels in the United States. Those hotels are able to house 15 million people. They are generally half full. So at any given moment, there are 3 million homeless people and 7 million empty hotel rooms. In the United States, education, for the most part, teaches people to do what? To endure boredom and to take orders. Uh, <laughs> you remember education, public school education. You look at the clock, but you don't get up and leave. Right? You're enduring boredom. Clearly, you have to take orders. If you don't take orders, that's clearly much worse than if you get a bad grade. If you get a bad grade, nothing happens. If you don't obey orders, you get expelled. Um, in the United States, there are 250 reported rapes daily. There's probably 10 times that number. I suspect more than 10 times that number that go unreported. In the U.S., the black infant mortality rate is twice that of whites. Uh, not to mention that in many black communities in the United States, you're living in essentially uh, armed and, and militarized uh, regions. In the, in the Dominican Republic, people earn a few dollars a day, roughly 50 cents an hour, so that U.S. multinationals can properly profit. If they dissent, uh, they are dealt with by local police forces who are trained in the United States in how to defend the system that remits that profit to the United States. Approximately 50,000 children die daily of starvation and preventable diseases worldwide. Um, these are things that can cause a rational, humane person to feel like maybe I should try to do something about what's wrong in the world, or so it seems to me. Try to understand, if, if the black infant mortality rate is twice that of the whites, that means one out of every two black babies that died is essentially murdered, right? Because it's a preventable death. If 50,000 people a day die of starvation, and that starvation is preventable with readjustments of institutional relations, then all those deaths are murder. They're not murder the way shooting somebody is murder, but they're institutional murder. So it seems to me that that's more than enough reason, and the reasons that other speakers have given, and the reasons that any of you can enumerate without much difficulty with just a little time given to it, 
to be thinking about the possibility of descending. But there are a lot of things that cause pain. Aging is not really fun, I've begun to notice. Um, it's not the best thing in captivity, but suppose somebody gave a speech and enumerated all of the pains and aches and eventual deaths that aging causes and said, let's go out and organize against aging. It wouldn't make much sense. And that's the way a lot of people feel when we say, let's organize against poverty, against racism, against sexism. Let's organize against these vast disparities of wealth and power. They feel like you might as well be talking about organizing against gravity or aging because there, because there is no such thing as organizing against these things. It's, it's, it's the way things are. Well, what's the logic of dissent and demonstration? Suppose you live in a community and there's a street corner and there's no stoplight at this street corner and there's a lot of accidents, and you want to get a stoplight. What do you do? Well, it's possible that you have a local agency that's in charge of that that's rational. So it's conceivable, perhaps, that you could just make a rational case in this instance. But let's say you don't. Let's say you have a local agency that has um, a set of interests that override any rational calculation of the uh, number of accidents. What then would you do? Well, you would try to raise the social cost for the people who make the decision about the stoplight. You would try to create a condition in which the people who make that decision will decide to put the stoplight in because if they don't, the stuff that you're doing is causing them so much aggravation, so much pain, so much loss of things they care about that they will make that change. Raising the social cost is the logic of dissent and of demonstrations and of protest. What we are doing, it seems to me, if we, if we are being strategic about our efforts, is we are trying to create a condition in which whatever it is we want, those in position to let move the levers of power and make it happen will do so rather than endure more of our dissent. It's pretty clear that that's what it is. It isn't rocket science. It's not that difficult. So suppose we want to stop a war. Now, now it's a lot bigger than a stoplight. And I want to make something very clear. The rationality argument, the argument that people are dying, is not going to do us any good. Why is that? Maybe we should make that clear. Um, during the war in Vietnam, um, the United States dropped plastic toys that hung in trees. They were small bombs. They were designed like mines to blow up. Kids would grab them and they would blow up. The purpose of these things wasn't to kill the child. Right? That wasn't effective enough. It was to maim them with the shrapnel from the explosion. The reason they were plastic is because it was harder to find the plastic. So it would burden the infrastructure of Vietnam to try and deal with the ailments. Now, if you think about that for a little time, we don't have enough time to pause and stop and think about it. The mentality that came up with that is not a mentality that will respond to the argument, you are hurting people in Vietnam. All we are telling them is that they are doing what they are trying to do. So that mentality doesn't work. Just like going to General Motors and telling them, wait, your policies are not benefiting your employees. They are benefiting you. That will not work. <laughs> Thus, what you have to do is raise social costs. You don't argue rationally with this. You argue rationally with the public. But you don't argue rationally with the elites which are benefiting from the practices that you want changed. You pressure them. You force them. So you raise social costs whether it be a stoplight or a war. What doesn't raise social costs is, is you know, an argument designed to convince them that they're wrong. Let me give another example of that. This is an important point because it, it, while it's understood in this context, it often slips out of people's grasp. So, for instance, um, there are a lot of people during, oh, say, during the Nicaragua Contra Wars would say, Go to your Congress people, go to various elites, and explain to them that their policies are pushing Nicaragua into the hands of the Soviet Union. Make a rational argument to them that they are acting contrary to their own interests. Well, the problem with this little approach is that the Congress people and the elites in this country are not morons. And if we can see something like that, they can see it too. And so it must be instead that the policy is designed to have the impact that it has. So in other words, the the embargo on Nicaragua, which pushes Nicaragua into the hands of the Soviet Union as a trading partner, does what? It allows the rationalization that we have to go in and destroy the Nicaraguan attempt to actually control their own lives because they are an emissary of the great Soviet monster in Texas and they're going to come over the border. In other words, you don't, or for instance, there are people in the media world of, of um, activism who say, well, we have to explain to the New York Times that their coverage is incomplete or inadequate or misleading. 
The New York Times prints all the news that's fit to print. That's what they say. Isn't that, doesn't that tell you? The New York Times prints all the news that's fit to print. Fit by whose standards? By their standards. When you go to the New York Times and tell them that their stories are jaundiced, are, are biased, are, are uh, incomplete, you're saying to them, you are doing a good job. You're not convincing them to do a job differently. So instead, you have to raise social costs for these institutions if we're going to implement them. The IMF, as described, the World Bank, the WTO, these are not stoplights. These are large, powerful, important institutions to capital, to the people who run society and who benefit from it. So what is it that we can do that is going to change their view of their their calculation, if you want, their cost-benefit analysis, to use their terminology, of whether or not they should persist in their policies. If you go back, how many people know what the Pentagon Papers is? Oh, this is a pretty political crowd here. Um, uh, if you go back to the, the period when the Vietnam War was winding down, and you look in the New York Times newspaper sections, you'll see periodically uh, so-and-so, a big famous lawyer or doctor or congressperson or a senator will hold a press conference and they will explain why it is that they all of a sudden have to change their view on the war. I supported the war, but now I must in all good conscience oppose the war. And what did they say? They never said, I must in all good conscience oppose the war because American GIs are, are dying. They never said, I must oppose the war because a hundred times as many Vietnamese and Laotians and Cambodians are dying. They never said, I have to oppose the war because it is morally abhorrent and it is an invasion of indo What they said was, our streets are in turmoil. We are losing the next generation. Meaning what? We are losing the value structure of the next generation, which is no longer interested in pursuing the old lines of approach and becoming a part of our system, but wants a different one. In other words, something even bigger, if it can be understood, even bigger than the war in Vietnam was in danger. Their whole approach to life, the institutions which give them the power and wealth that they have, was under some attack. And the war was aggravating the threat to that. And so one after another, they would say, look, I, I would really like to win this war. They would say that quietly under their breath. But I have to come out against it because the impact it's having on social movements is too dangerous. The threat is too great. That's what it means to raise the social cost. So let's ask what actually does raise the social cost at that level. Suppose that a movement exists, whether it be about the war in Vietnam or, or what's going on in Colombia or the question of racism or, say, the IMF or the World Bank or globalization. Suppose a movement exists which can send 50,000 people or 100 or 200,000 people, I don't really care, to Washington every other month for a demonstration. But there's no trajectory of change. So is that a threat? Does that raise social costs? Now, once it plateaus, it's nothing. All it is is a, ta a cleanup task the next day. Now suppose that a movement is going to Washington and is sending more and more people. Suppose that a movement goes to Washington and instead of 200,000 people, there's 100,000 people, but there's 5,000 people doing civil disobedience. And the next times it goes, there's 150,000 and 10,000. And then there's 220,000 and 18,000. And so, so what is being, what's the message? The message is, the longer these policies persist, the more people become aroused, the more people become committed, the more people through that process become so committed that they're willing to break the law. Suppose that the, the demands begin to broaden out so that it's perfectly clear that what's at stake is what? We're losing the next generation or we're losing the current generation or we're losing middle-aged people or the working class. Uh, suppose that happens. That is a threat. This is a very important kind of concept. It is very simple, but it matters a lot. It concerns me greatly, for example, that if you look from Seattle to now, for all the celebration, if you look from Seattle through Washington and L.A. and Philly, uh, you don't see growing numbers of participants in the demonstrations. That's not a threat. I'm sorry. It's, a, it, it's disruptive. It's got costs. It's putting things on the table. But it is not a growing threat that is going to be sufficient to overcome and get rid of 
the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. So we have to ask ourselves, what is it about what we're doing? Is it that the civil disobedience? No, because that's a, an integral component of a movement that's going to be threatening. It's, I think, I don't know the answer to this question, but I think that a good part of the problem is that, that we have, are, are losing track a little bit of the fact that we need not just increasingly militant, increasingly aroused, increasingly aware small numbers of people, but instead growing numbers of people. And that we need mechanisms that reach out to those growing numbers and that say to them, there is something that you can do other than traveling a thousand miles to a demonstration, being ready to endure gas and clubs, and on top of it, perhaps lose your job because you miss work and have no kids left because you have no place to put them when you come there. Somebody once told me a story about the Intifada you know, in, in uh, Israel, the, the Palestinian movement, which was exceptionally powerful and moving and rich and broad and involved a huge section of the Palestinian populace, all kinds of people, old people, young people, really young people, newly parents with their kids, et cetera, et cetera, doing civil disobedience. And it went on and on. It was having tremendous impact. But over time, there began to be a frustration. And the, the, the people in the age bracket of, you know, 20 to 30 began to get angrier and angrier, totally understandably. And they turned toward more and more aggressive tactics. And after a while, the tone of the demonstrations changed in such a way that those broader constituencies could no longer come. Somehow, we have to find a way to to retain the civil disobedience, which is the cutting edge of our dissent, which communicates the trajectory that is threatening, and yet attract more people, uh, ever-growing numbers of people. Because without ever-growing numbers of people, it's not an ongoing threat. Uh, why is, um, is the fact that... that uh, very few people are interested in whether Marion Jones wins her race tonight a problem. Recently I spoke at um, the University of, uh, of Pennsylvania or Pitts, the place where Joe Paterno is the football coach. What's the, what's the name of the university? Penn State. In College Park in, Pitts, in, uh, in Pennsylvania, the conference. I spoke to a few hundred people. I asked a very similar question. In, in College Park, um, is that the name? Of it? No, it's, 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 sorry, Capital City in Pennsylvania. It is? Okay. Um, there's, a, there's a stadium and there's a city. The city, small city, has about 40,000 as its population. The stadium houses about 60,000 people. Every weekend the stadium is full. This tells you something about what's going on in this city. I asked the audience of about 300 students, these are organizers, on a campus with tens, I don't know, 20,000, 30,000 students, how many had been to a football game? One football game on their, in, their, in their university. Um, four or five hands went up, all black. Uh, nobody else had been to a single football game. I asked how many people had been into one of the sports bars in the vicinity of the campus to try and organize their fellow students. No one. In fact, they found the idea incredible. Right? They were so afraid of, the, of, of, the of, of, of even conceiving of doing such a thing. This is a serious problem, I think. The, the, it's... It is desirable that this set of people has become so courageous and so committed that it's willing to travel from the middle of Pittsburgh to Washington and demonstrate and get arrested and get clubbed and get gassed. That is not a bad thing. That is a very, very good thing. But it is undesirable that they have developed a kind of, of, of culture, if you will, and of community existence, which makes them a absolutely, almost from Mars on their campus. You can distinguish them at a, at a snap, any member of it and everybody else on the campus. And their ability to communicate with the other people on the campus is horribly crippled by this. Now, if all we needed to do to end the IMF or to get rid of the disparities of income that I talked about was have a relatively small part of the population, highly politicized and highly militant, it wouldn't be a problem. But that is not all we have to do. That is not all we have to do. Some people are in political activity because um, they want to be able to look at themselves in the mirror in the morning, basically. I think that's a valid reason. I think that should be part of our reason for wanting to do political activity. 
morally, personally. Uh, some people are in it because, because um, they, they, they want to fight the good fight. They want to be on the side of justice. They want to be right. There's an element of that that should be a part of what we are doing also. But too few people, I think, are political and are socially involved and are activists because they want to win and because they believe it is possible to win and, you, and have that guide them and guide their thinking and guide their strategic work. That is what is necessary. Without that, it's hopeless. With that, it isn't just hopeful. It is possible. It is, it, it is, it is, it is, it is, that's the step. That's what's needed. It, what's needed is to be strategic. When we are strategic and when we come to realize what's necessary to make these changes, um, we behave differently. There was a demonstration during the war period. It was called May Day, um, uh, for those of you old enough to remember. Um, People, Tom Hayden, you may remember his name, Rennie Davis, go around the country, give speeches. Rennie Davis was probably the most eloquent speaker I ever heard. Um, Tom Hayden was an eloquent speaker. They would go around and they would, they would say to their audiences, come to Washington May 1st. We're going to shut down the city, stop the government, stop the war. Um, and they would give these powerful, emotive talks, um, gut-wrenching. Uh, and people would go and people would demonstrate shutting down the city, wild in the streets, and people would go home, and the government kept going, and the war kept going. Now, Hayden and Davis knew that the government would keep going and the war would keep going, but they organized in such a way that when people went home and turned on the TV, they were deflated instead of empowered. Another thing that we have to understand is where we are and what we can, what we can hope to accomplish and not um, grasp defeat from the jaws of victory, right? You go and you do a demonstration and you raise consciousness and you raise awareness and you increase the number of people and you look and you say the IMF isn't ended and you, 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 gra you grab defeat from the jaws of victory. The victory is building a larger movement. Um, the defeat is, is mistakenly thinking that you should have ended it in one day. So, um, do I have a little longer? Three minutes? Um, what, I was, what, uh, what I would ordinarily do is I would now ask the question instead of just why dissent and what its logic, what, why revolution and what its logic is. We don't have any time for that. So, um, <laughs> so we'll just knock it off the agenda. No. So uh, another time. But I would like to say one other thing that I think is, is in, in 19, uh, 30 years ago, when, when, when movements began, the women's movement began with, with women getting together and talking to each other and discovering that pains that they felt, um, battering, um, just being ignored, um, having less income, working harder, being et cetera, et cetera, were social, were, were also endured by lots and lots and lots of other people, basically all of the women, and were social phenomena rather than private inadequacies. Michael Harrington wrote a book about poverty in which he basically did the same thing. It isn't as if nobody knew that they were poor people. Certainly poor people knew that they were poor people, right? But what people didn't somehow grok was that it was an, a social phenomena, a social problem, an institutional problem. The same thing happened with respect to race, and that was in the emergence of the civil rights movement. We can't replicate that because I would argue that nowadays everybody knows, everybody knows that poverty and racism and sexism and, and disempowerment and alienation and all the other crap that people endure are social problems. No one thinks that it's, you know, everybody knows at some level that the whole damn thing is stacked. So you can't arouse people by enumerating all the things that are wrong. All you're doing when you do that is you're saying to people again, well, you're suffering and it's painful. But that doesn't arouse anything anymore because it's not, it's old news. So it seems to me that that the obstacles to, to motion in the United States is not that people are happy. If people are happy, the TV wouldn't be full of advertisements selling things. You look at them. They're selling things by selling happiness. If everybody was happy, that wouldn't work. 
everybody's miserable, and so selling happiness, those images of happiness in the ads, that works because everybody would like to be a little happier, a lot happier. The, the, the obstacle to, to progress in the United States, progress in building movements, is not that people are satisfied, not most constituencies, not when 1% owns the same as the bottom 95%. It's not that. It's that people don't believe there's an alternative, and people don't believe you can fight City Hall. Those are the two things. And what I would like to suggest is that the movement and the people who are centrally involved in setting the tone of movement discussions has just got to come to understand that we can't, that we have to move toward answering those two questions. What's the alternative? And by what's the alternative, I don't mean just what's the short-term alternative. Because the populace is smart. The populace, whenever they hear a short-term alternative, says, yeah, but in the long term, the markets will swamp it. Private ownership will swamp it. Right? It will go back to being exactly what it was before. So they want to know, what are these small, what are these short-term gains lean toward in the long term, which makes a whole institutional setting which allows people to, to live real lives? So we need a vision. And they also want to know, how do you... How do you organize and accumulate the power of our populace in such a way that it raises social costs to win those short campaigns in a trajectory of empowerment which eventually wins that vision? And those are the things that I think a good deal more time on the left should be uh, devoted to. Uh, thank you.